I'm going to give you a lot of information today. Uh, cr uh, composition is um, a vast subject with lots of different approaches. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a lot about different things, show a lot of pictures. But the whole idea really is to give you some food for thought and things to think about and things to consider in your own work. Uh, creativity has been a major part of my life for as long as I can remember. Uh, I started with music when I was very young and went to music school for my degree. And I spent close to 20 years as a musician, a musical arranger, and producer. Uh, 11 years ago, I made a slow transition to full-time landscape photography, which, by the way, people have asked me, how did you do that? And if I started to tell you, we'd be here all night. Um, it's a, a, a very long process, but uh, it's also been and, and been incredibly, incredibly challenging on many levels. Uh, however, I feel extremely fortunate and grateful for every moment that I get to spend in nature. The one constant throughout all of my creative experiences has been the act of composition. It's combining things in ways that express something meaningful, uh, sounds, notes, frequencies, instruments, tones, color, shapes, light, and ideas. Now, much has been written and said about the art of composition in landscape photography, and it's been described, it's been calculated, it's been graphically explained, broken down into rules and prescriptions, and compared to other art forms like music and sculpture. Yet, it still remains elusive to many of us. The fact remains that, as I said before, it's a very complex subject, and studying it can make it seem rather mechanical. Uh, yet when it's done successfully, it looks effortless, simple, and natural. So my goal in this talk is to try to bring those two sides closer together, to unify them, if you will, so we can get, a, we can get closer to the true essence of what composition is. Uh, this can only be a personal approach, my approach, because there are many other great approaches, resources, and artists to study and learn from. And I couldn't possibly cover all of them uh, all of them here in the fraction of time that I have. Plus, I'm still learning, which, by the way, is the best place to be for anyone who wants to be creative. Uh, I always say, and I tell my kids, that um, I'm much more interested in what I don't know than what I do know. Because as long as there's something to find out, that keeps my curiosity going. That keeps me hungry and inspired. And so that sense of always seeking further and growing further, the idea of growth, is pretty much essential to everything that I've done as a creative person. So in this summary, which, uh, so this is kind of a summary, what I've learned, what I've practiced, uh, of my journey in composition. One that I, like I said, I hope inspires you to think more deeply about composition and why it should be the most important component of your photography, as it is and has been for me. So what is, what is composition? The dictionary says composition is the artistic arrangement of the parts of a picture. For me, composition is the essence of any visual artwork. It establishes the relationships of the, objects in, of the objects in the frame. And we derive meaning from those relationships. The task and the greatest challenge of any landscape photographer, and I would add the greatest privilege, is to interpret what is most important to him or her into a form that communicates it clearly and effectively to others. Now, while the traditional rules of composition, rule of thirds, the golden mean, leading lines, they help us to come to grips with the frame we have to fit everything into, seeing with strength is the way to make powerful images. Artist Alessandra Batelli said, developing a composition is a continuous flow of ideas where the artist combines, adds, adapts, and discards the various elements in an unending discovery of new possibilities. Uh, to me, that sounds a lot like jazz. It sounds a lot like improvisation, the stuff that I did for a long time, where you're constantly adapting to what you hear, and you're also uh, responding to what you hear with your mind, with your heart, etc. So regardless of the definition, one thing is certain. If the composition or design of your picture is careless or flawed, your pictures will fail to resonate with the viewer. And that's the fastest way to put, uh, to put out your creative fire. Cameras, software, techniques, technology, they come and go, but the art of composition still remains at the heart of creativity. 
Now, photography uses a visual language that is highly flexible, adaptive, yet it relies on a well-defined grammar. And the key, at least for me, is knowing and internalizing the grammar so well that you learn to use it most effectively like language. Uh, you adapt it to your creative goals, just like a poet does with language, for example. The rules are only a guide, but you are free in the most liberating way to explore the creative possibilities. However, there's a, there's a responsibility that comes with learning that language, and that is that we, in fact, respond. That's kind of the, when you break down the word responsibility, you respond to what you see and you experience. And for that to happen, we must, we must respond with our hearts. That, in my view, is the ultimate ingredient of composition that uses the principles as a guide, and simply a guide, with the goal of inviting the viewer to take a journey into the photographer's mind and heart. The question is, how do we arrive at the point of identifying and creating a strong composition? How, how can we be more confident that our composition really tells the viewer what the picture is about in the simplest way, without any ambiguity or confusion? Another reason I enjoy the challenge of composition is because it creates a bridge between the two things I've done as a career, music and photography. And I think it's played a huge role in the way I compose images. Great music commands attention. It's, it isn't static, it moves, it breathes. And what interests me the most about uh, the comparison of music and photography is creating a sense of movement, similar to the way music moves from one point to another, and how it moves there, and how quickly or slowly it moves there, whether along time or place, emotion, tension, uh, a sense of aliveness. And I think the strongest compositions do the same. They have a sense of movement or of energy. That's, why I try to, that's what I try to capture in my work. Both as a musician and an arranger and photographer, I've recognized many similarities that you know, have shaped my approach to composition and photography in general. So for example, uh, you can think of these uh, similar sorts of concepts and ideas. There's composition and arrangement, how we arrange tones to create a melody or harmony, how we arrange all the parts in a picture to make something cohesive, something that fe feels and looks unified. And as a landscape photographer, that's pretty much all you're doing because you are basically trying to control the chaotic nature of what we see with this rectangular frame. There's rhythm, otherwise known as visual rhythm. That's a sense of not only how quickly your eye moves through the picture, but where it rests and where it doesn't have time to rest because you are exploring different points or different shapes. Uh, the sense of how you can manage that, again, is going to make your image more effective or less effective. There are frequencies, of course, high frequencies and low frequencies. Bass, which was my favorite instrument and still remains my favorite instrument because you take the bass out of a piece of music and somehow something feels really, really missing. <laughs> um, and it, you know, the low frequency notes provide a foundation. They provide uh, a root for melody and harmony. And similarly in, in photography, they, uh, not only do they provide a grounding for the image visually, they also emphasize light because anytime you have shadow or dark tones, your eye is going to gravitate towards what's bright or what's lighter. They actually give, uh, they actually highlight the things that are brighter. And so dark tones are very important. And again, that's a, that, that can be a very musical sort of idea. There's also tonality uh, and color as it affects warmth. We often think in uh, music t in terms of being uh, warmish or coolish or perhaps a major key and a minor key. Those have two different sorts of uh, emotional effects. And the same thing with color, right? Whether a, an image is warmer or cooler, that actually has a tendency to push us in one emotional direction or another. And if you have both, they actually tend to move within the image, right? Warm colors uh, come forward, cool colors recede. Uh, finally, volume or dynamics, right? Or lack of it. So what we call quiet or calming images or images that are aggressive. And that's, again, something that we see used really, really well by great composers with dynamics and how they can make, uh, how they can create crescendos from virtually nothing. So one last point about music, specific, specifically jazz, uh, which I want to mention is how my study personally and my love of jazz and improvisation almost defines the way I approach nature photography. A jazz musician must be willing to lead and be led. Uh, 
and to follow intuition and be open to surprises. And anyone who spent any time in nature knows that, that this must be the case with nature because you're not going to tell nature what to do. You must be willing to adapt and to take advantage of situations, but also be willing to um, uh, be surprised because you never know what's going to happen. Judgment and attachment are almost in direct opposition to creativity. So the solution to a creative challenge is often not what we expect or expected. And being open to the moment as it unfolds is so important, especially in nature. There are some parallels here to Zen and mindfulness. I'll leave it up to you to explore those on your own or read my other books because I talk a lot about that in those books. But again, I'm not suggesting you have to become a musician or a painter or some kind of a, a, a Zen monk. Um, what I am saying is that you uh, learning to draw, um, by the way, as, as far as painting goes, you know, for me personally, learning to draw has also been immensely helpful because when you learn to draw, you learn to see what creates form, what creates uh, shadows and highlights, what creates depth, how you create a sense of perspective. And again, these are all tools that you can use when you're in the field and things are happening very quickly or very slowly depending on your frame of mind, and you must react to things that are happening. But simply adding all of these things at whatever level you're comfortable with, uh, adding them to your scope of influences will improve your visual intuition. And it'll also make it perfectly clear how important visual design is to making successful images. Visual design is something I've studied also uh, quite deeply and I cover in every one of my workshops. And to be quite honest, the whole topic can seem rather mechanical, both from my point of view and also probably from the student's point of view, and uninspiring, telling, telling students that they now have to go into the field and start looking for lines and curves and shapes and color combinations and all the rest seems like a, a, an easy way to kill the excitement of a sunrise in a beautiful landscape, right? My favorite analogy is that of a music student that is forced to practice endless scales daily as I did and resented many years ago. Right? I found it hard to believe that somehow this repetition would lead to an inspired performance in the future. But it's the very act of internalizing the scales that leads to hearing the notes and their relationships in other ways, adding to a musical vocabulary. And eventually, this, the ability to use them to make actual music that communicates something to the listener. And it's the exact same thing that happens in any visual medium like, any visual medium like photography. I'm often asked if I consciously look for shapes and lines and curves and all, all the others and the building blocks of composition. And I totally understand that question. It's like, do you actually walk around looking for this stuff? And the answer is that I used to. I spent lots of time, lots of time focused on mechanical ways of seeing, trying to break down a composition into its individual elements. And while I made lots of, um, shall we say, uninspired images that way, uh, those images were much more important to me than the successful ones because they taught me a great deal about how we see as humans as compared to the way a camera sees. After a while, you stop depending on this kind of mental checklist and you start to see things more naturally, more intuitively, more photographically. And it takes time and practice for sure, but it's not beyond anyone who makes the effort to practice diligently. And I'm gonna say that again, it's not beyond anyone who makes the effort to practice diligently. Now, you'll start to slowly see ways of composing an image that is cleaner or clearer, I'm sorry, and simpler. Now, as an exercise, one that I did many times, photograph a tree in as many ways as you can. Practice and use all the design elements, leading lines, diagonals, patterns, etc. Then do it again and again and again in different conditions. Everything you learn can be applied to any landscape, whether grand or intimate. So when I'm in the field now, I look for those things that pique my curiosity first, the things that inspire me, or uh, best of all, make me feel something inside, especially when I feel gratitude. I look for light first. Light is always the main ingredient. Um, it reminds me also of what I just heard about an hour ago, which is someone asked Paul Campanigro, what are your influences? What are you inspired by after 50 years or 60 years of photography? And he said, light. And I thought that was brilliant because that's where you start 
And that's where you never end with. You always start with light and you never get tired of exploring light. So I start with light first and when that leads to something that I think I can capture with the, within the camera's frame, then and only then do I think about how to use the language of composition effectively. The inspiration has to come first because then we use the tools with intent and with a purpose. That's easy to see in a photograph. The viewer remains intrigued. It's also easy to see when that is not the case. Something doesn't feel right, the viewer loses interest immediately. These are two of my so-called uninspired images. So let's talk about some specifics, uh, the fundamental core principles that I use in composition. Um, and for me, the core principles are basically three things. Number one, establish a center of interest, right? Establish a focal point, if you will. Number two, lead the eye, control the eye. Lead the eye so that it's very clear to the viewer what it is that you're trying to show them without any ambiguity or confusion. And finally, unify the composition so that everything feels in balance. The fastest way to accomplish all three things is through simplicity. Easier said than done, of course. I'm still working at it. Simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful, right? And that's a great quote by John Maeda. The focal point doesn't have to be a specific subject, all right? It can be light, it can be mood, it can be a feeling. The focal point means that the image is about something. It's something that you can describe in as few words as possible. One of these, exam one of these uh, exercises that I ask my students, can you tell me what this picture is about in, in a sentence or, or, or less, right? And if they need three or four sentences, again, you're getting away from this idea of simplicity. In this picture, the viewer's eye travels easily through the frame. Every part of the picture adds to support the focal point. You might say the focal point is that rock in the center there because that's the one that has the most amount of texture, the most interesting light. But actually, that's really just a way for me to emphasize the real focal point, which is just the mood and feel of the moment for me because it's grounded, it feels still and, and silent, and yet at the same time has a sense of depth to it. It means concentrating exclusively on what's essential and leaving anything out that's not, right? This is uh, an image where there were lots of trees, not just these four or five trees, there were lots of trees, but I wanted to try to simplify it so that I was left with just enough to get my message across and nothing, and nothing more just a little bit of the lines of the trees and the shapes they create and the shadows they create, a little bit of the color, and just enough of the fog in the background, and that's all I need. Any more, and it dilutes the purity of the message. As I mentioned before, those three core principles, right? Establish a center of interest, which is probably the foreground rock as a primary thing, and then it leads up to the distance. Lead the eye so that there's no confusion about where exactly they should look and unify the composition so it feels balanced, so it feels like everything is kind of in the right place uh, and where it should be. This is an evolving thing, by the way. There is no such thing as a finished or a final composition. You evolve as a person, as an individual, as a photographer with the things that you're photographing. And so as you move forward, you get better at doing this, and as you get better, you also discover you need to know more, right? And so you never kind of finish this path. The more you know, the more you need to learn. And to me, that's a wonderful thing. That's a great place to be, as I said before. Now, I want to talk a little bit also about formats and frame borders, because these, these also uh, influence composition, right? The, we're talking about composing things in this frame, in this rectangular artificial frame that the, that the camera creates. So it's important to be extremely mindful of the format and the borders and how they affect the core principles I mentioned before, leading the eye, establishing a focal point, and unity. Um, don't limit yourself to one specific format or orientation. Explore, be open to all possibilities. Sometimes a horizontal might be stronger, sometimes a vertical is better, sometimes a panorama is better, okay? All of these provide interesting ways of composing an image, some more challenging than others, but you should be open to all of them. The borders of your frame are just as important as the interior parts. The borders create edges, and those edges will impact the things that you're photographing, okay? And that definitely will affect unity. It definitely will affect how you control the viewer's eye. So for example, in this case here, the edges of the frame and where I placed the edges 
were probably more important to me than the center. The shapes in the center are already defined by their nature, but the borders create additional shapes. And so I've tried to repeat the same pattern of triangles by placing my borders along shapes that will create more triangles. And that's done through moving left and right, moving in and out, right? And again, the borders there are really important to make sure that you unify all the shapes and then you get something that's more cohesive, more balanced. Here's an image where my initial reaction was to shoot it or photograph it horizontally. By the way, that's a Freudian slip because I try not to use that word shoot, and yet it's so ingrained in our men, uh, mental, uh, you know, uh, the way we talk about photography. But I don't particularly like that only because I think we make images, and what I'm talking about here, for sure, this is a process that you have to go through. But this was my original, my original capture, and while it had all the elements that I wanted, it wasn't as strong as I thought it could be. I saw what I wanted, and yet I saw much more than I needed, and so I switched to a vertical format, and now I was able to distill that to something simpler, and I believe more, uh, stronger, at least at the time that I made the picture. I may feel differently in the future, but this is what I have to show you now. Once again, considering the edges very carefully. Uh, there's a lot of uh, movement here. There's a lot of information to sort of manage. And by controlling the edges, I'm able to make sure that the eye only can really flow in one direction, up and down. Plus, as I said before, where you place your edges will create additional shapes. And if you manage those shapes carefully, you can create uh, patterns and repetition. Things, again, that I talked about having to do with rhythm and visual rhythm. Using panoramas to create a wider sense of depth, right? More, more rhythm and more interest. Panoramas are fairly easy to make. Uh, in terms of you know, just seeing in that narrow format, but they're very easy to make complex. And so it's always a good uh, idea to try to maintain a sense of simplicity. Here's using a panorama as simple as possible. And the reason why I made it a panorama is because uh, I only wanted just a piece of that log that's behind the fern. Uh, if I make it a regular image, meaning a regular 35 millimeter format, I've got too much information top and bottom. This decision, by the way, uh, was probably made when I made the image. So as I'm making the image, I'm already seeing that there's information that I'm capturing above and below that I don't want. And I'm trying to uh, visually imagine in my mind as I look through the viewfinder, I can almost like mentally crop, so to speak. Again, that's something that just takes practice and being aware of it. Uh, and another panorama where I wanted to emphasize not so much the up and down movement of the trees, but their shapes and the different sizes of their shapes and how that pushes your eye forwards and backwards. And ultimately, it isn't about any of that at all. It's about creating a sense of what this place is and what it might be like to be there, right? That's really what it's about. But we have to use, again, this grammar that, I've, that uh, I mentioned before. So the grammar uh, is where we get into the elements of design. And design, for me, is really important because that's how you get to express yourself. If you understand the design, then you can kind of put it to the side after you kind of have a grasp of it, and you can get to seeing, and you can get to experiencing and, and, and trying to convey what you want to convey to your audience. So design elements, uh, and I'm going to approach this a little bit differently than, say, a lot of composition books on photography explain, or even as I've explained it before, because we hear a lot about lines and things like that, and yet there are no real lines in nature, right? The lines are there because of the edges that the shapes have, and how we place our camera, our viewpoint is what determines where those, how those shapes intersect with each other. So I like to think of them, or actually, I just started to think about how I see the stuff when I look through my viewfinder. I think of it more in terms of masses and shapes. You have these, all these different shapes, and you've got masses that create areas of interest. So that's one design element. There's color, of course. Color, very, very powerful thing. Repetition and rhythm. And the last, which is balance. The idea of symmetry versus asymmetry. Managing visual weight. The weight of masses and shapes, colors, and rhythm. And finally, as I mentioned before, light. Right? Light is kind of the glue, or it's sort of the uh, everything. All of those individual design elements are under the direct influence of light. And you, 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 I think you should uh, make that a focus because if you take kind of light out of it, then you're not really going to have the best way of using this language. It's like saying, you know, you want to use a language, but you want to leave out half of the words. No, you have to kind of use the words that help you to really say what you want to say as simply as possible.
So in a way, you could say light is the most crucial element that defines or determines how effective these, all of these design elements are. So shapes, right? How do we use shapes and masses? You know, the way you arrange the major masses or shapes in your frame creates the lines that I mentioned before. They're not there. You have to almost force them onto the viewer. Um, and you, you create the lines through composition. The goal is to make them lead the viewer through your image. So in this case, the way I've placed those masses on the bottom, I mean, there are a bunch of rocks, but they all kind of unify together to create one mass because they're a particular color and a particular texture. And that comes from this idea of just thought. Well, when we see things that are similar, we kind of group them together. Right? That's one shape that then is reflected um, or emphasized by the calmness of the water. Plus, I've got other shapes that all sort of lead your eye in the same direction, in the same way. All right? And so again, using the shapes to create direction. And the direction comes from lines. But really, no one says, hey, I see your lines. They just say, you know, that's an interesting picture, or the picture resonates with me, or it doesn't. Right? And that depends on how effective you are at this. Once again here, um, the light is the thing that defines or creates the shapes, and the shapes create the lines. Everywhere from the foreground with the rocks and their, their lines and shapes all the way up to the sky. So I might have walked past this scene here a couple of times when I was here and not really thought much of it until all of a sudden the light showed me. The light sort of brought it to my attention. And then that's the thing that then again made me want to frame it a certain way and see if I could uh, make the strongest use of the light and the lines. Now, one key feature of shapes and masses, uh, something else that, again, I sort of do automatically and I'm now s starting to really think more and more about is this idea of, of active versus passive. Active shapes, shapes that are active, have patterns, they have texture, they have more detail relative to other parts of the image. And passive shapes lack detail or they lack texture. Uh, you can use these two types of shapes to create interesting lines to create contrasting elements to add balance or tension to an image, right? Areas that are passive tend to be a place where the eye can rest or isn't necessarily pulled to. Areas that are active are active. It means that they want and call for attention. The, 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 the key thing is that they all have to support the focal point. So in this case, the sky is definitely passive because while your eye sees it and it adds to the rest of the image, again, everything is a question of balance. The active areas are the rocks, and to a lesser degree, the trees in the background. But they have different amounts of activity, and how you balance those things is what helps you to make a very clear focal point and make the image feel unified. Too much activity is hard to manage, and it also makes it, potentially makes your image very busy. And an image that's too passive, well, it's too passive, right? It's like a piece of music that never gets going, <laughs> right? Never, never gets your attention. So that's an example here of active versus passive. Uh, Another example of active versus passive, and also um, using masses or shapes as a way to draw attention to the main focal point. The more variety you have in your masses, it's just not about having three shapes uh, all of the same tone or color, but if you've got variety in them and they create an interesting pattern or texture or lead or point somewhere, then the more interest it'll add to an image, especially, uh, as I said, if they have variation. So here's another example of, again, active versus passive, right? Uh, the whole top of the image, half of it is basically passive as it relates to the rest of the image. Remember, you never want to consider anything in a photograph in isolation. There's no such thing. Everything has to be considered with what else is in the picture because the idea is to unify it. So the bottom half is active, the top half is passive, but it's the interest between those two things. And it's active and passive in more than one way, not only texture, not only in detail, but also in color, right? Much more monotone at the top, much more color in the bottom. And who cares whether I split the diagonal, whether I split the image 50%, you know, and put the horizon at 50%. That's just a rule that, as I said, is a guide. But if you find something in your composition that is stronger, that leads the eye, that makes it a clear focal point and unifies it, then that's all you need. That's the most important consideration. Again, using shapes and the masses and the lines they create, but also active and passive. Uh, I particularly like uh, blurring water, right? Because when you blur water, that potentially gives you a passive area that if you have other shapes around them, like rocks or grasses or things like that, again, that gives you a way to create lines. 
an active area next to a passive area creates an edge, and that edge is a line. And then you can use that uh, visually in your, in your, in your uh, composition. Again, another example of active-passive. Here, I didn't have to do anything, really. I showed up uh, on the uh, shore of the Hudson River, close to where I live, and there was a perfectly calm morning with no wind whatsoever, no uh, cargo ships sailing by to create waves. So I had this big, beautiful reflection, and so I just needed a way, what, to create more interest, because now I had the opposite effect, where I had so much calm water, I felt it was too passive. And so by moving along the shore, I found an area that created that active edge to the passive area, and that allows the rest of it to sort of flow in place, the reflection of the clouds, a few rocks. But basically, that creates a sense of how I felt there, right? It was perfectly calm and quiet, peaceful, nothing going on except my own thoughts and my own questions about what is it that I want to convey here. Colors, that's the second of the design elements that I mentioned. Colors, extremely powerful, right? They evoke emotions, they create depth, dimension. Complementary colors create visual interest. They also create edges and lines and all those artificial things that we look for in our composition. You, I'm sure you all know, warm colors come forward, cool colors go back. But here's an example where I just wanted to use one color and try to find as much variation in that color as possible with what? Uh, very, very few active areas in the bottom right. Those little areas that just create a sense of uh, uh, rhythm, but just in a tiny, small amount to balance out what is another large area that is just simply color. Uh, studying the color wheel is a great way to learn to use colors in your composition because they will show you uh, the way we see as humans, our, our, our natural tendency to equate colors together and to push colors that push each other apart. And so here, mostly this picture is about how I use the colors. That's what I first noticed. And so I'm trying to balance the strong, warm reds of the flowers in the foreground with the cool blues in the background. Not only, not only in, in terms of what is in the behind and what's in front, in terms of creating depth, because depth is always one of those things that you want to try to create in nature and landscapes, but also in terms of their balance so that, because you know warm colors definitely tend to call for more attention. And so that's why I've tried to balance them in a way that the whole image feels kind of unified. You can use the idea of active and passive when it comes to colors as well, right? If you have lots of colors, you can surround it with areas that don't have color. And that's another way of sort of emphasizing the areas that do have color. An image that is completely saturated from top to bottom is just going to be very difficult for you to emphasize what the focal point is. And so there's two ways to make something more saturated. You can crank up the slider for saturation on that thing, or you can desaturate the areas around it. And that's kind of what I did here. I just kind of pulled the color a little bit out of those rocks in the foreground. Because quite honestly, when I was standing there making this picture, the color of the rocks wasn't interesting to me. It was the other things that were more interesting. Here's another picture that is mostly composed around the relationship between the colors and how your eye moves from bottom right to top left using the, ver the variation in color and knowing how our eye tends to go from cooler to warmer colors and how the colors interrelate. And again, this is just practice, study, looking at other photographers, other painters, other artists, and see how they use color and how it affects me. And if I see something that I say, hey, I love the way the color is being used there, what is it about the use of the color there that makes me feel or see it this way? And then I try to incorporate that in little bits and pieces, right? Repetition and visual rhythm, that's another important uh, design element. Uh, patterns and textures, they create rhythm and repetition. And again, that creates active areas that keeps the viewer interested and engaged. And so here, I kind of just want the eye all to go to the center, because the center of the image is the area that was most fascinating to me, how in the middle of the desert, this plant that is very hard and robust and, and very difficult to even touch has these beautiful threads growing inside, the contrast of the, of the way this plant can survive. But the picture's not really about that. It's just about this sense of pulling your eye towards the center and creating this other world, which is what I saw when I walked by this plant. Rhythm, as I said before, can keep you engaged. And so you have to find a way to make sure that there are areas that move the eye and, other, and also areas that slow the eye down so that you can emphasize what it is that uh, you want the viewer to see. And so while there's just a bunch of trees there and they're all kind of repeating, 
I looked for something that would slow it down, that would bring something more toward the, towards the foreground. And that's why I have those two or three trees there. They're also creating interesting shapes, uh, triangular shapes. And that's, again, something that you see that is, just puts it a little bit out of place of everything else behind it. And that's sort of lifting that up and showing you what the, the kind of the focal point is surrounded with in context of everything else. Uh, once again, using active and passive areas, bringing those trees forward and trying to let them breathe by, th by themselves without anything interfering with them. I also took the color out because the color wasn't adding anything. So for me, that's another one of those uh, questions that I ask myself. If the color helps or if the color is an integral part of the image, great. But if I think that I can make a strong image without the color, that's something that is then weakening my comp uh, composition. I'll take the color out and you know, uh, make it into a black and white image. So this idea of, of active and, and, and passive shapes and masses, in many ways, it determines a fourth element, balance, right? And that's really a question of how unified an image looks or feels, how much visual weight each element has, and how it affects, again, the core principles, right? The focal point, the path, and the unity of the image. So again, you can see now active and passive, right? The texture of the rock on the left, with the smoothness of the water on the right, that creates a very simple shape. And I'm not using the line to guide you through the image. I'm actually using the color itself. The shape of the color is what kind of pulls you through from bottom right uh, to kind of top and into the center. And where there's most color, in terms of the warm color at the top, I've surrounded it by areas that are dark and desaturated. So again, it allows those things to kind of breathe by themselves. Uh, again, this was in a marsh where I loved the way it felt and the way it looked and the different colors, but how do I manage that so it just doesn't look like a, a, you know, a picture of just grasses growing in every direction? So one way to do that, uh, at least for me, was to find ways to manage where your eye goes and how quickly it goes from one area to another. Again, this idea of active versus passive or interest versus less, in, less interest. But they both serve each other, and so without one, you don't have the other. Uh, if it's just water, then you just have water, and without the grass, uh, and, and if you have just the grass without the water, then you just have a lot of grass and no real focal point, no real way to control the viewer's eye. Here's another example of an image where I started off with sort of a lot of complexity and trying to manage sort of the busyness. And so I used the fact that there were no clouds at all. And so because there are no clouds, in my mind, that gives me an area that allows the eye to rest. And so I kind of go, I kind of build up the image from the bottom where it's very busy. As it rises to the top, it gets much simpler and simpler and simpler until uh, it reaches a state where it just feels more unified, right? And that's like going from dissonance to harmony, right? That's another musical term where we start off with things that don't quite sound right together. And eventually, a great composer will sort of find a way to resolve them. So in the following slides, I want to show you a few examples of uh, my thought process You know, in a couple of images for each picture, three or four or five images for each picture. And this draws heavily on everything I've just talked about. Um, I do this, again, as efficiently as I can in the field. But in my mind, these are the things that I'm considering. And one of the reasons why I know that I'm considering these things is because when I return back home and I examine the pictures and I analyze them and I look at them and see um, what I've captured, I can remember and recall how I went about trying to find the core element of the picture. And the beauty in that, and the thing that I also recommend to people, is that if you can connect those two things together, meaning the inspiration and your thought process and the thing that inspired you to press the shutter, now when you're in front of your computer and you're trying to decide what to do with this image, in Lightroom, for example, now you have a clear path or a much clearer path because you have an intent and a purpose. That's much different than, oh, I shot this image and I have no idea what I was thinking. Let me see what I can make with it. To me, that's a much more ambiguous way of developing your images because you're not starting with the thing that inspired you. And if you're not going to start with inspiration, as I said before, then what are you going with uh, if it's not coming from inside? So this is my first uh, picture. and. Really, the light was the thing that was inspiring me. Here, there are too many active areas, right? I felt, and this is all happening in the field, right? So I feel, well, okay, I like that first picture, but 
um, I, I need to find a way to make it simpler and because the eye really is not going anywhere, particularly where I want it to go. And I'm just doing this by looking through the viewfinder. That's another reason why it's important to use a tripod because when you use a tripod, you take the picture and if you look through the viewfinder again, the composition is what you just shot or what you just captured. And so I can review my capture without actually looking at my LCD. I can say, okay, let me see what I just captured. And I look through my viewfinder again and I can make an adjustment. The reason why I prefer that is because if I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm going to see things that are changing. If I'm looking at my LCD, I'm not seeing things that are changing. I'm looking at something that happened a while ago. But if I'm looking through my viewfinder and all of a sudden I see something change, because it always is changing in nature, ah, I can react to that. I can use what I just did and respond and modify my composition so that I take more advantage of the thing that I'm reacting to. So that's the first picture. The second picture, I move my camera a little bit. I'm, I'm basically in the same place. I move my tripod, I change my position, and it's better because now I have less active areas. I'm really trying to create this uh, movement from bottom left to top right, except that I'm still not happy with that bush there because as I say, one of anything in your picture is is going to be something that pulls the eye, right? If you have one of anything, it's the only thing, and therefore it's something that must be important. And I don't want any, I don't want that uh, little green bush there, as beautiful as it is, because I, I don't want to make a picture about green bushes. I want to make a picture about the light. And so I get rid of it by moving and, and I actually moved, if you notice, I just basically moved my camera just so that my frame went to the edge of the bush and the bush is now gone. And now I've got exactly what I think I want when I'm there, which is the, the, uh, uh, contrast between shadow and light and how your eye moves easily from bottom to top and I've removed the active areas so that there are less active areas there's a nice balance there between the two and I got a much simpler clearer image about my intent here's another example where I started uh, in this big open area and I'm looking for a foothold right I usually start that way okay here I am the lights coming up where do I start Right? What do I? What am I? What? What do I? What do I photograph here? Right? And lots of times, I used to just set up the camera and start shooting. Right? Now I tend to slow down a little bit and say, Well, what is my eye? What am I reacting to? What do I see here? What am I seeing in more than just my eyes? But what is it that's really I'm really responding to? And so, um, I really just like the shape of this rock uh, and the way it was just sort of sitting there in this big open landscape. That was my initial uh, picture. I'm looking at side lights. Light is coming from the side. But again, similar to the other picture, not quite there yet. Too ambiguous in terms of what it is that I want to convey. And I've also got a little busyness on the left. So I decide to make a total 180 degree turn because if I want to capture the side light and what it's doing to the uh, rocks there, then I have to go in either side light, either looking north or looking south. So I turn around. I'm looking. Uh, south now, and the sun is rising on my east, on the east side, and now I've got a much better image. I've got a stronger image. I don't have that problem with that green tree that was on the left, uh, but again, the rock is a little bit too much. There's too much of it in the foreground. I don't quite have a real intimate sense of where I am, so I move in, and this is something I probably wouldn't have done years ago, but now I move in and really make it simple, uh, and I've almost made it too simple. In fact, I believe I have based on the next image you're going to see, right? But the reason for that is because I've lost sort of the shape of this rock that I really like, which is that those repeating elements, those circular, the circular movement of the rock. It actually had like three layers. And I don't want the shape that's in the front there, which looks like it's been carved out or it's been chipped away. I don't want that to be so prominent. I want it to be a part of the whole rock. So I back up just a little bit. And I'm also, I'm also able to take advantage of the shapes starting in the diagonals, right? As we know, diagonals or the corners of your frame uh, are key points because that's, that forms a corner and your eye almost always gravitates into corners just naturally when you look at an image because it just it's the natural thing to do. So anything that starts in a corner is going to be a very strong place, a very strong foundation to start a way of leading the viewer into the picture. And that was basically my final, uh, my final image. So these are very small changes, but when you're using a wide-angle lens, or even a long lens for that matter, small changes on your tripod, whether you're shifting the camera, uh, rotating it left and right, or moving it up and down, or moving your tripod up and down, that makes really big changes, will change uh, 
the relationship and the perspective, your point of view, and dramatically alter a simple thing like a line. But that line can make the difference because the viewer, the viewer of your pictures doesn't really think about design. They just look at it and it either controls their, what they see or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, well, there are lots of other pictures to look at, right? So here's another example. Um, once again, my first sort of response, my first instinct, but not quite um, there yet. I'm trying to use, again, the diagonal, so I've placed a little rock on the left, but I also got that rock on the right. It doesn't really know whether it wants to be in or out. I've heard people say it's like a little rock that's waving at you, um, but it's not sure if it belongs. So it's still not quite um, unified yet, but it's a start, and it's a thing that I start with. So I'm looking through my viewfinder. The light is changing. The light's coming up. This is all happening during a period of a lot of activity, right, the fog and all that. So I move a little more. I change my sort of perspective to try to make those, that idea stronger. And I've got now a little bit more strength in the picture. I've got a stronger diagonal. But still, I still feel like there are too many rocks. There, there are too many things that um, more than I need is, is what I should say. So I shift my perspective again. And now I've basically got it down to the bare essentials. I've got it down to the, on, the only things that I need for that picture. The only things that I need for that particular composition. Each composition, again, it's, you have to look at it on its own merits and what you're trying to do. And then because I don't really need the color, I don't think I need, then I converted it to black and white and made it a little bit square because that even strengthened the movement through the picture, made it a little bit square. And so I'm not uh, afraid to modify that, to modify my format if I feel that it makes a better picture. The, uh, the, the, the important thing to realize is that this is, what I, this is the only thing that I could do when I was in the field because I can't crop my sensor. So I knew in my mind, OK, I want to make this a little narrower. I'll do that afterwards. But seeing that in the field is critical because if you're not seeing that in the field, then you're not going to be able to respond or to be aware of other compositional possibilities. And that's really important. So finally, I want to say light. Again, always the best place to start. Always be aware of light. Never ever um, set up a composition without being aware of where the light is. This picture here is totally because of the light. Without the light, this picture, I don't make this picture. It's about the light that's hitting the flowers in the foreground and the light that's in the, in the arch there relative to the darkness in the background. So photograph light first and subject second. I want to end with a quote. Do not grasp the brush before the spirit and the thoughts are concentrated. And my last uh, words that I want to say about composition and photography in general is the most important question to ask yourself is why, right? Why do you photograph and what do you want to share? And I've thought long and hard about this and come to the realization that for me, I just want to make a difference. I want to give. The best way I know how to do that is through gratitude. So I want to express gratitude. And to do that as powerfully as possible, I need to feel gratitude. So nature and the landscape gives me that feeling. And for me, that's probably the best thing about being a human being. So I want to inspire others to make a difference as well. So don't worry about being original. Focus on being authentic and being sincere. And then your work will reflect that, and others will notice. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.